Well, it is my pleasure to introduce Paige Olson, who I met through the Snoqualmie Valley Network. Uh, we're co-mentors through the mentorship program. And so I've had the opportunity over several, I guess, committee meetings or what meetings, seminars, whatever you call it, to get to know her a little bit better and to find out what she does besides mentor to young boys at Carnation Elementary. I mentor at Ofstad. And I got this long bio this morning, but she's a, a very, very, very interesting person. Um, she's, what, third, fourth generation Seattleite. She's lived in ni 19 years in Carnation on how many acres? Four acres. She's got rescue horses, dogs, a retired farm cat. Um, she um, has, ha in her own past, um, had some issues with going to elementary school, although she did attend Lakeside, so kind of a brilliant person like Bill Gates. Um, she's got two children, and um, after some issues with going through parenthood like parents do, um, her husband's a retired police officer. Um, after some struggles, she homeschooled, homeschooled her children. Um, and then she's come into this, what we're going to hear from her today. Uh, she's an observational listener, and she's going to talk to us today. I'm going to read it because I can't remember it. I'm a lawyer, but sometimes I still have to read stuff. Over the last 15 plus years, she has spent time in planning, been the director for and organized multiple day camps for Club Scouts, child force camps, and fire festival events in Seattle. While involved in the Cub Scouting, Paige received the District Award of Merit, and in 2016, she was selected to be a collaborative author in an Amazon best-selling book, Success Manifesto, featuring, featuring Brain Trans Tracy, I don't know what that means, over there, okay, for which she received a Quilly Award for being a best-selling author. Last year, she became one of the original mentors in the new, that's where we met, in our, our mentorship program. Today, she was going to share with us why she believes we both as individuals and as a society need to make seeking to understand more important than happy. So, my friend Paige. Well, I thank Kelly for asking me to come and share with you some of my thoughts and feelings that I have developed over my lifetime, literally. I'd like to start by asking you all a question, especially to the member that is going to have a child soon. How cool would it have been, or would it be, if your child came with a manual? Not a how to raise or parent the child manual, but a manual that helped you understand the biological wiring of that child. So that as you raise the child, you had something to go back to to understand the behavior from, right? Or, and as the child grew up, you'd have something that you could pass off to them to say, this is your biological wiring, right? I mean, how cool, think about that. How cool would that be if you had that manual today in your life? So when you came up against stuff, you go, well, wait, wait a second. Um, let, let's see, just a minute. Uh, I'm challenged here. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I can go to my manual, and that manual is going to help me understand that because this is how I'm wired, my biology, my DNA. The stuff that came from the pots that my parent had to offer me, they only have certain things that they can offer, and it's a crapshoot what you got from each of your biological parents. And they mixed up and created a unique, an individual you, each of us, while all human beings, right? We all are uniquely different and we engage in this world uniquely differently. So how cool would that be? My journey started back in kindergarten, which we'll talk about in a minute. But my journey as a parent really started not when my child was born, although at my child's birth, instead of counting fingers and toes, I promised both of my children I would do one and only one thing as their parent, that I would seek to understand them first. 
That was the only promise that I made to each of them. And so when my son was two and a half years old, and it was one o'clock in the morning, yeah, 1 a.m., and he's sitting up in bed, sucking his thumb, happy, smiling at me, twinkle eyes, and refusing to lie down to go to sleep, I had to stop and say, what's going on here? I promised him to seek and understand, but in that process, I had gotten lost as the parent because it was one in the morning and I was exhausted, tired, and frustrated and had no idea where to go. And I didn't have a manual, right? It was missing. I didn't have a manual. And as I sat there on the floor, leaning up against his blue sports car bed with him sitting there going, what's wrong, mom? I remembered something. And that came back to my years in the horse world. See, horses can't talk to us, we think. But actually, they're very, very good at communicating to us, just as good as our children are. But they communicate through their behavior. And their behavior is telling us two very important things. One, how they're feeling in the moment. And two, what is their core biology? Who are they? And as I sat there and looked at my arm, I remembered an incident I had had with the horses about five years before. It was an incident where I would have been asked to ride a horse where the humans had admittedly said, we screwed up with this animal. We put too many new riders on her and she's having mental issues and problems and we want her to ri you to ride her to help us through this. I said, fine, I'd, I'd be happy to. And we saddled her up and we checked everything and we made sure there was nothing we were doing that was going to cause her discomfort or whatever. Remember, we only could ride a horse if the horse allows us to ride them. And this horse was fine with that. And I got on and, and we checked me and I wasn't bumping or anything. And things got really good. She actually calmed down and started listening and started thinking and started to trust me. Back in my son's bedroom, we'd started out that way. We'd started out in a really good place that evening when he wouldn't lie down, wouldn't go to sleep. I did start asking questions. I went to my mom's mental list and I said, how would the day go? His eating, his nutrition, the normal ebb and flow of what I knew from his child and it was fine. And I asked myself, well, what about the sick list? Right? And I went through that, coughing, sneezing. He didn't appear to be sick. And I derailed. At that point, I derailed. See, I went from seeking to understand my child to going, oh my gosh, the time's going by and there are things I want. I want to get done. I want to do my needs, my goals. And in that derailment, I started treating my son incorrectly. I stopped thinking about who he was and what his needs were. He was two and a half years old. I didn't get mean to him, but I deserted him. Emotionally and mentally and physically deserted him. I'd come back from time to time and try stuff. And we'd done the same thing with the horse. Things had gone well, but we came up against that time and there was a goal that the trainers had. And we pushed past that goal. Instead of listening to the horse and saying, we need to stop here today, they said, we need to get this horse over a two and a half foot jump. Because that was their goal. And it ended badly. It ended badly for me. And it ended badly for the horse. See, perfect timing, a little extra pressure, and she went over the jump. Yeah, she went over the jump. <laughs> but she landed really poorly. She wasn't ready. And because she landed poorly, I landed on the ground. And at the time, it didn't seem like there was any damage. She wasn't, didn't appear damaged, although later she came up sore. I didn't appear damaged, so on the outside, we appeared fine. And life went on until four days later. My boss said, you're saying that your wrist is a little stiff, and because of the job I held at that time, which was working for the King County Medical Examiner's Office as a field metal legal death investigator, I needed to be okay. And he says, you have to go get that x-ray. And I did, and guess what? It was broken. My wrist was broken. That caused a problem for my job. And I went back to two and a half, three weeks later and got it re-x-rayed, and guess what? My elbow, it was broken. Yeah. It didn't feel broken, it didn't act broken, I didn't think it was broken, but it wasn't broken. And that is what reminded me sitting there with my son that while I couldn't see what was going on, something was wrong. My son's behavior had been very consistent. He would not 
stay lined out. He would cheerfully lie down, and then like a jack-in-the-box, he would pop back up again, and he wouldn't stay lined out. Was he being bad? No, he wasn't being bad. He was giving me a message, and it was my job to figure the message out. He didn't come with the manual, right? Two o'clock in the morning, we walk into the emergency room at the hospital, and, and he's happy and whatever, and I'm, of course, exhausted and drained and looked like a wreck. And we saw a doctor. And to make a long story short, he had pneumonitis. He had pneumonitis. He couldn't have bacterial infection of the lung. He could not lie down without being in pain. And he was trying to tell me that in the only way a young child can communicate that to us. So we have to be aware of what's going on and we need to ask the question, why? We have two choices in life. We can ask two questions. We can ask how and we can ask why. And depending upon what we choose to ask when we're dealing with not just children but each other backstory, we don't know the hidden, what's hidden behind, inside or behind in our past experiences, we don't know. If we choose the how story, we're gonna derail ourselves. How can I get this to stop? How can I get them to treat me this way? How can I, how can I, how can I? We will de just derail ourselves, and I'll explain that in a minute. But if we ask why, if we ask why, that will lead us down the path of seeking to understand, to get knowledge, and then to be able to act correctly. It's like a disease. Right? We can treat the symptoms. How can I get the headache to go away? We'll take some aspirin or some Tylenol and get it to go away. Great. But if we fail to go down the why avenue to say, why did I have the headache in the first place? Guess what's going to happen? This is going to keep repeating and repeating and repeating. And it might repeat, but if we say why, then maybe in the repeating we'll go, oh, I know why that's happening because ugh, I didn't get sleep or didn't eat right, whatever. But we have knowledge. We can change what's happening or we can ha let it happen but ha let it happen with knowledge, which will change our behavior and how we deal with it, okay? I was called one day by an acquaintance, and she was in total crisis. She said, my five-year-old daughter, this was last school year, my five-year-old daughter, she's in kindergarten, and she's kicking the principal, and they can't stand it, and I'm staying at home, and I'm all stressed out, and I'm gonna have this meeting with her, and all I, want, all I want is for my child to be happy. That's all I want. I want her to be happy. But she's kicking the teachers, and she's doing that, and I don't understand, and I don't But all I want her to be is happy, and she kept repeating, all I want is for my child to be happy. But where does that get us? Right? Happiness as we see it, is an outward expression of joy. But that doesn't mean that's what's going on inside. When I worked for the medical examiner's office, I can't tell you how many times I went on a suicide, and everybody's going, I have no idea why they killed themselves. Oh my gosh, they were so happy. They were so happy. That facade of happiness, <coughs> nobody looked past it. And at some point in their time, they learned how to put on that facade of happiness because that's what he wanted them to be was happy and nobody saw the pain that was beneath the happiness. So this little girl is not happy and her behavior is not acceptable. She's kicking. I get that. It's not okay to kick. It's not okay to hit. I get that. And we have to, like with a headache, we have to deal with that symptom. But we can't stop there. But we have a choice. We can go down the how path. How do I get this behavior to stop and stop there? Or we can go down the why path and say, what is behind this behavior? What, what's the message? What is this child trying to tell us that they have no other capacity to tell us with? So I talked to her. And in talking to her, this was not a new place for this child. This child had been at this private school as a preschooler. But kindergarten was different, expectations were different. And she said, my child, so the first indication was, my child doesn't do change well. Aha! So we have this iceberg, where the behavior's above the water. And down here at the bottom, we have our biology. Some people call it nature. We have our biology, and in that biology was change. She got that part. But as we talked some more, something else started to come up. And that was, as her child was a lower 
energy person. There's nine traits to temperament, and one of those is your energy level. And this was a lower energy child placed in a high energy classroom. And in, as she talked to me, she realized the behavior always happened at the same time of the day. There was consistency, and it was telling them something. And she was going to go on this, have this talk. The, neat, the nice thing is, in this case, she was asking why. While she wanted her child happy, she also wanted to understand why so things could be fixed. And they did proceed to go into play therapy, which is awesome because you don't have to do therapy. If you watch how your child plays, they're going to communicate with you things they can't communicate in any other way. If it's where they're playing with stuff, not on the computer, but with stuff, they're going to tell you how they're seeing the world and engaging in the world and the arguing and all that kind of stuff, they're going to tell you. And then you're going to understand things that they can't tell you in any other way. And, and so things have been settled down and they, they've started to understand why. But our biology filters up through our environment and we get behavior. If you go down the how train, this is how damaging it can be over a lifetime. When I was in kindergarten, she mentioned school was, formal school was not my place. I went to kindergarten, right? I went to school, kindergarten. And we had a lot of rote memory to do. I don't know if you remember, but in kindergarten, there was a lot of rote memory to do. And I was told we had to memorize the months of the year in order. And there was a song, January, February, March. I could do that. But she said, no, you have to say it, not sing it. And when I did that, I couldn't do it. I always left out October, always. And she gave me all these, if she's a great teacher, she was a great teacher, she gave me all these ways to be able to do it, and all of them had to do with the left brain, what we would call left brain stuff. And I failed. And her response at that point was not to say why, was to say, how can I get this kid to do what she needs to do because she's not stupid and she's just lazy and whatever. And so she took to embarrassment. That was her solution was to embarrass me publicly in class every single day for weeks until I finally was able to accomplish this task. And, first, and, and what I learned from that inside as a little girl was, you don't understand me. In first grade, I acted out in class. Yeah, I acted out in class. And I got severely punished for acting out in class. And guess what I learned from that? I learned not only do you not understand me, but you don't care. Those were the two messages in my head for decades. What did I do at the time? They thought they'd solved the problem because I became quiet, reserved in the corner. I was a smart kid who was really quiet and did her homework. They had no idea how much I suffered inside. None. And I became, I had extremely low self-esteem and that's why I got into two very abusive marriages, all right? My self-esteem was on the floor. And it wasn't until I worked for the medical examiner's office and had an amazing boss who actually started helping me see that I was capable and competent. And he trusted me, implicitly trusted me, because he would sign death certificates on my word. And that was the beginning of my climb out. And it's all because the important people in my life, the adults in my life, chose to go down the how can we get her to stop this behavior instead of why is this behavior happening in the first place? Okay. Critically, critically important. Why is this happening? When my son was four years old, we were going to co-op preschool. We'd gone to three-year-old preschool. I was the assistant instructor and whatever. Things went well. Co-op preschool, they started the ABCs. And my happy go lucky, everybody loves son during circle time became a disruptive monster. And they started going down, how can we get you to stop this behavior? We're gonna discipline and punish you, train. And I said, no way, no, no way. We're gonna go down this, what's going on, why? So I pulled him, and that's why I started homeschooling. And over the years, this is what I discovered. He's dyslexic, so am I. I, this speech, remember through pictures in my mind, I created a picture book. I didn't write it out. It's not words. It's not this or that. It's pictures. 
How cool would that have been if there had been a manual that somebody knew that I had a JPEG instead of a word mind? And the teacher could have helped me memorize the months of the year because I still remember them through picture book. I have a picture book that's the months of the year. How cool would that have been? I wouldn't have been disciplined. I probably wouldn't have gotten in trouble in first grade. I wouldn't have had a low self-esteem. So what do we do about it? I become a mentor. I homeschool. I've worked with kids. I've listened to kids. I've looked at behavior as a messenger. That is my job to try and understand what the manual is trying to tell me from the environment they're in so that I can then help them grow and help them connect to who they are because it's through connection that we find happiness. It's through connection with ourselves that we can take the roller coasters of life, the ebbs and flows, the ups and downs, without getting ourselves way off track. My son didn't read till he was 16, but he was smart. And he did amazing things. He was one of your search and rescuers. And he was a search and rescue team leader before he could read. He was a trainer before he could read. We discovered how he learned his primary learning way. That was 16. He's now six years later. What is he doing? He's been a paid firefighter for the Shoreline Fire Department for the last four years. He's a volunteer fire lieutenant up in Gold Bar. This is, he's only been reading for nine years. He's written manuals for the department, the volunteer department, and he's in the process of putting together his second volunteer training and running training programs. We have these sayings that we have. We have these things that we do that we judge and we label and we put people into boxes and cartons and stuff and from those we believe what they're capable of doing and not capable of doing instead of saying what's your biology what's your manual what does that look like how can we help you become the success that you were put on this earth to be that's the question that is the iceberg and I'd like to share with you one of my very famous favorite reminders and it's a quote from Simon Sinek's book start with why and the quote goes if we're starting with the wrong questions if we don't understand the cause then even the right answers will always steer us wrong eventually and who pays the price when we fail to ask why the child does. And eventually that child can be us. Okay? Can be us. The question is, is what am I doing now? I've, done, I've worked with kids for years, 12 or 20 years, in all these different things that she mentioned. So where am I going now with this information? What can I do? And I've been searching a lot for what can I do? How can I make a difference? And recently, I have come in contact with some pretty amazing people. So the journey is working with my daughter. Um, we're going to be looking forward to starting a nonprofit. And that nonprofit is going to be to create a bigger map of the ranch that I have now, the mini ranch that I have now that has an adventure playground, a workshop, gardens, animals, plowing, horses, plowing with horses, doing things with animals, uh, and um, workshops and things where we're going to first focus on the first responder, our police and firemen, that I believe as a society, we don't understand, first of all, what they see on a daily basis and what they're experiencing on a daily basis, but we sure are good at judging. We sure are good at accusing and causing. But what happens is being the wife 23 years of a police officer, and raising two first responders in the fire service, both my son and my daughter are in the fire service, we're failing those children. Because we're failing to ask what's going on in their heads with what we are doing with what those parents are bringing home. So that's where I'm, besides working in the schools, that's kind of where I'm going with 
you know, where, where I'm moving as far as bringing this idea of we need to start asking why and helping build a manual for our children so that when they become teenagers, they have this manual and they understand themselves so that they can start picking the right place to go after high school, the right interest that they have. Not the interest you have for them, but what they choose to do. The right stuff for them so that they can connect. If we can't connect with ourselves, we can't connect with anything or anyone else, including real, true, deep happiness. So all I ask is everybody you come up with, in contact with, know they have a backstory, know that they are uniquely individuals, and seek to understand. Listen, really listen, and seek to understand. And with those children, know that that behavior is biologically driven and influenced by their environment. And while we need to not allow physical harm, that's not acceptable. We need to acknowledge and the power of acknowledgement is this. I have one little boy at uh, Carnation. And he, I've, I've been given permission to share this. He came from inconsistency, moving, and different dads, and all this kind of stuff. He doesn't have a bad mom. He doesn't have a bad stepdad. But his biology and all the inconsistencies and all the movings and all the this and this real dad is in his life it's causing problems, and he was pulling hair at school. And everybody was going down the, how do we stop this train? And you know what he needed? This is all he needed. He needed somebody to acknowledge him. Acknowledge his feelings. I didn't want to take the snow off the sidewalk, but my stepdad needed me to, you know, wanted me to, and so I did. And I said, oh, wow, good to know. Glad, thanks for sharing that with me. Yeah, shoveling snow can suck. I get that. That's all he needed was to be his feelings acknowledged. One day we sat there. We'd been together a month, a month and a half. And we were sitting there, and he said, we were playing a game, and he says, I hate you. I ask you, what would you do if a child said that to you? I hate you. And a few minutes later, would repeat, I hate you. Would you start to lecture them? Would you show up again the next week? Would you say, good to know, each time, good to know. That's what I said, good to know. And what happened is 20 minutes later, half an hour later, when he went back to his class, you know what he said for the first time? He says, you're coming next week, aren't you? You're coming next week. He was testing me. He wanted to know, could he push me away? Because everything else in his life had gone away. Could he do that? When I came back the next week, not only was he anxious to see me, he shared with me something that was important in his life. That was his breakthrough. That's all he wanted to know. He didn't need a lecture. He didn't need me to go down the how train. He didn't need anything like that. He just needed to know that I heard it. Because he doesn't hate me, but he was testing. We have to ask ourselves, why is this behavior happening? The behavior iceberg. That behavior is a piece of all this stuff that's coming up for each and every one of us, but for children as well. Anyway, that's what I have to offer today. Um, this is the book we were talking about. Brian Tracy is an internationally renowned life coach. Um, anyway, you're welcome to any of the handouts I have here if you're interested. And any questions at this point? Thank you. Thank for you for your time. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, I don't have it handy, but uh, we do, and uh, for our speakers, uh, in their names, always uh, donate uh, 150 pounds of food to uh, Northwest Harvest. Uh, anything else that uh, for the good of the order here? Well, very good. Well, thank you for joining us this morning, and uh, have a great week. We'll see you next Thursday.